Um, so with conic sections, in the past, a lot of what I've done is really just get you in groups. Like if you look at your assignment, you don't have an assignment sheet. Um, if you look at this assignment sheet, ah, So if you look at this assignment sheet, your homework tonight says begin review one and review two. Um, and then you'll see tomorrow night it says finish review one and review two and that random miscellaneous conic stuff, stuff review. Which means my goal is to get through and remind you about all the things to do with um, ellipses, hyperbolas. I'll probably do more of that tomorrow and get, well, I'll probably get started a little today. And then uh, parabolas and circles. Uh, your job normally has been made easier in this section because when we do summer reading, I test you over all the conic sections on those summer reading quizzes. You didn't do summer reading. So it's probably not going to be as fresh as it has been in years past. I'm just telling you that up front. Sadly, we don't have a whole lot of free time to stretch this out. So if we need to, I might go a little bit light on the math team stuff um, that we're going to be talking about on Monday and give you a, more, a little bit more time for Q&A if you need that. But, um, but I'm just gonna start walking you through some of this stuff and reminding you about some of the details of conic sections. Are you with me? Okay, so um, if you have questions, if you're like, oh man, I remember conic sections perfectly, well then you can go ahead and start working. I can tell you this, I was just making the keys out for your exam, and even I'm a little rusty on it. I was like, oh, difference in focal radio, oh yeah, 2A. You know, length of the, uh, the lateral recta, oh yeah, 2B squared over A. I was having to dig back because it's been a while since I've talked about it, okay? Because again, we did, I didn't do any summer reading stuff to kind of dig it out of mothballs. So it's one of those things that you're gonna have to probably memorize some things that have, that have evaporated from your long-term or short-term memory. And um, I would strongly suggest you to make a really big push today and tomorrow to make flashcards, do whatever you gotta do. Um, to kind of get this stuff fresh in your brain. But most of it, if not all of it, can be found on, um, in your notes. So if you flip to, towards the end of the book, So if you flip to page 81 um, in the book, you'll start seeing the first thing I want to talk about, which are uh, circles. And I'm going to try to get through all the circles, all the parabolas, point out all the things that you need to know about them, how you can graph them, little bitty nuances like what's the length of the lattice recta and how you link equations to graphs uh, or vice versa. And then, uh, again, if I have time, I'll start easing into ellipses and hyperbolas. But again, this should be a review at some level for you, kind of like sequences and series was a lot, and that we had done a lot of that before. So first thing, circles. Um, hopefully everybody remembers that circle form. You've been seeing that for a while now, right? And you know the center can be found by looking at the values with the x and the y. And what do you do when you see something like x minus 2? The coordinate would be the 2. And if it's something like y plus 3, the y coordinate would be negative three. So you kind of change the signs to get the center. And then whatever you have it equal to over there would be your r squared, which means to find your radius, you square root that to find your radius. Uh, you remember how to find an area of a circle is pi r squared, right? What I kind of want you to realize also, and this will help you with an ellipse, ellipse's air, interior area is an area of a circle. We just say pi r squared, but it's really pi times that length times this length, which is pi times r times r. On an ellipse, if you remember, they kind of look like this, right? And you have that length is maybe your a, and that length is your b. So where this is pi r r, or pi r squared, the area of an ellipse will be pi a b. 
Are you with me? And there's proofs for that that I'm not, that aren't really that important, I don't think, to, for this class. But that's something we'll come back to. But um, so graphing a circle, it shouldn't be an overly big deal. If you have it in this form, you take the center, you find the radius, and you sketch it. And if you ever get something ugly, like say I had something like, a, is this one really pretty? Yeah, that one's too pretty. What if I had something like, um, what if this was 12 instead of 16? But I asked you to graph this, um, this circle. What are you gonna do? The radius is clearly not a nice, neat whole number, right? So what would your radius be? Two or three. Two or three, and that's great to write as an answer, but when it comes to graphing it, how would you graph if your radius was root 12? And you didn't have a calculator. Between three and four. Yeah, you know that root nine would have been three and root 16 would have been four. So root 12 must be somewhere in between three and four. And it's probably leaning a little towards the three side since it's three away there and four away there. It's probably something like 3.4. So if you were sketching this and it did have a radius of root 12, just go over about three and about a half three and a half, three and a half, three and a half, and do your best job drawing a circle like that, okay? So you'll probably see something like that. And remember, if you have inequalities, like this was not an inequality, but what would you do for something like, this is what y. So for this particular one, what would you do, and this is not on this sheet, if you had a, say a less than 16. What happens to this solid line? It becomes dotted, and where would you end up shading? Okay, so just plug a point in. Yeah, and I like plugging in the origin, I mean the center. You can plug in the origin here, and if you do that you get 25, and then four, which is 29. Is 29 smaller than 16? Or is 16 bigger than 29? No, 29 is not smaller than 16, right? So I would not shade that origin. But you can do that, but it's so easy to plug the center And If you plug the center in, you just get zero less than 16. And you know real quickly without doing a whole lot of math because both of those cancel. And that is true, right? So in this case, I would shade in there. Plus, this is kind of like this is saying, hey, all these circles that are smaller than that, that's kind of the way I think about it. All of these circles smaller than that radius of four, that would be a whole bunch of other ones in here. So you're gonna uh, shade the center and make that a dotted line. And if it was something like this, then bigger, you're gonna shade the outside, but leave it a solid. Are y'all with me? Okay. So um, hopefully there's not a whole lot about circles that's gonna trick you up. Do you remember about completing the square? And can you look at a problem like this and tell me what kind of a conic is or your best guess at a conic? Now you know it ends up being a circle because literally that's what I graphed right here. That is what was graphed here. So if it has the same numbers there, it has a shot of being a circle, but what else has to be true? Well, actually, same numbers, circle. But I, I say same signs and the same numbers. So like if that was positive 4, positive 4, positive 3, positive 3 on the x squared, y squared terms, doesn't matter about anything else. Then it's got a really good shot of being a circle. And when I say a really good shot, here's where it would not be a circle. What if you had something like... Um, What if you had something like, I'm trying to think of a good number. What if that 39 was a positive 120? And it looks like in my first step here, I divided by three to get rid of those, because I could, because they both had threes here. And if I did that, this became a 40. Do you remember the process of completing the square? Okay, if you don't, remember you move the constant over, so this would have become a negative 40. All right, now that that's gone, you group the x terms together, the y terms together, and then you complete the square. And the process of completing the square says this. If your coefficients of your x's and y's have 1's, which they do, 
because you already divided that away. If they do, then all you have to do is take half of the 10, which is 5, square it, which is 25, and then remember, whatever I do to this side, I do to that side. Okay, right here, half of the 4 is 2, squared is 4. If you add 4 here, you add 4 here. Now, what would have happened, now, originally it was a 39 changed to a 13, negative 13, you add it up and you got this. But what would have happened if there was a negative 40 there? What would negative 40 and 25 and 4 end up giving me? Negative 11. And then, when I factor these, and remember, what are these trinomials going to end up being once you complete the square? Those trinomials end up being what kind of trinomial? Perfect square. That's why we call it completing the square. You just, you could call it make the square or make it a perfect square. They just call it completing the square. You turned it into a squared uh, term. So that ends up being a perfect square. So it can factor as a perfect square, factor as a perfect square. But if I end up with negative 11 here, if I did, what does that mean? I can't have an imaginary radius, right? That's R squared. If I square root that, I get an imaginary. Is that, does that mean that this circle doesn't exist? Yes. So it just wouldn't exist. It's not like it's some, you know, illegal thing. It happens all the time. So when people look up here and they go, hey, look at that. Two, they're both positive three. It must be a circle. You really don't know yet until you finish completing the square and you can take a look at this last number. And then also, what would happen if you ended up with a negative 29 here. Like, so the whole time, say that was an 87, and you divided by three and got 29, you subtract it over. What would happen if that happened and you ended up with a zero? Y'all remember this? It ends up being a dot, which we call a degenerate conic. You remember the degenerate conics? The degenerate would be, remember that, um, Remember this funny little, uh, oh. lost part of my cone. Oh. That stinks. Get Michael Mormon to print any other such. Anyway, remember this cone? If you ever take a slice, these slices make the different cone, like the slice horizontally. I know it's kind of hard to see, but that makes a circle. Right? If I slice it at, a, at an angle like this, um, that makes an ellipse. If I slice it straight down, this part that's missing, remember this cone is really a double napped cone. There should be a second cone on top. If I slice it straight down, I get the hyperbola. There's the bottom part of the hyperbola. There's the top part. And if I slice it parallel to the side right there, that's what gives me a parabola. Okay? Well, if any of those slices I make happen to go through the tip, right, which none of them have so far, but if they happen to go through the tip, so like instead of slicing it there, I slice it and just touches the tip, that's a point, that's a degenerate slice. If this slice for an ellipse happens to go through the tip, that also is a point. So degenerates have different values, but a degenerate circle, where you end up with a zero, that's a point, and if you end up with a negative after completing the square, that just doesn't exist at all. bummed. I'm losing my slice right there. All right. And then, um, um, so anyway, a little bit of that's going on. Hopefully this will help you with these other ones that we're doing. Um, but as long as you're able to graph, complete the square, answer questions like this, I think you're going to be in pretty good shape with circles. Okay. Now moving on to ellipses. I mean, I'm sorry, parabolas. A lot more going on in a parabola. Okay, first of all, parabolas actually have direction. Unlike a circle, right, that doesn't really show a direction. So parabolas could be either going up or down, or left or right. And the way you tell is when you have it in this correct form, whether it's y minus k, a, x minus h squared, or x minus h, a, y minus k squared, these that start with y, how do they open? They open along the Y, so they open up or down. When do they open up? When the A is positive. So if that's a positive value, I'm opening up. 
It's a negative value I'm opening down. On these that have X, once it's completed, the square is completed, if X is first, those open right and left. When is it gonna open right? When A is positive and then left when A is negative. Right, so that's the first thing you can observe about it and it's important to observe. Next thing, um, how do you find the vertex? Yeah, H and K, same way you dealt with the uh, um, same way you dealt with the center, except we don't call it the center, we just call it the vertex. But it's we change the sign of the number with the X, change the sign of the number with the Y, and that's our vertex. And then um, then now you gotta figure out there's this relationship between what the A does to the equation and what the A does to the graph. Now the A value not only controls direction, but it also controls the width. Really big A's like, and I say big, like four or eight or 12. Bigger A's make the graph what? You remember? Really skinnier because they're stretching that graph up more quickly. Really small, and when I say big, I mean like big positives, big negatives. Smaller A's, like A's between negative one and one, fractions like a fourth or a half or an eighth or a twelfth. What do they do to the graph? stretch it out like that. Or maybe if it's going down, stretch it out like that. So if you have really wide graphs that have really wide openings, those are values of A that are smaller, like a 12th or an eighth or something like that. Ones that are really skinny are values like three or four or 10, whether it's plus or whether it's minus, okay? Now the connection, how do you start graphing them? You could always plot points, but that's such a bad way to do it. There's two ways that I go about graphing these things, and then I'll come back to this. The first way I go about graphing it, it depends on the A. If the A value is a bigger number, like three or four or five, then I just do the same thing that I've always done with parabolas. Like, if I had a parabola before, when we were graphing earlier this year, let's just say we had something like y minus two, three, x plus one squared. What's your vertex? Negative one, two. So way, the way I would have graphed that, I would have gone negative one up to mark my vertex. I know because y comes first, it's either going up or down. Which way is it going? Up because it's positive and the y comes first. So I know I'm graphing it up. Well, isn't a normal parabola that had a one there? If there was a one there, if you remember about graphing, all I would do is from there, I would go over one, up one, over one, up one, or over two, up four, right? Do you remember doing this? And then we would come in here and we'd sketch a graph. So what does that three really do? What does it always do when you have a number like that? So what do you do? You. You have triple whatever your Y movements were. So if my Y movement was up one, I'm gonna go up three. I'm gonna go three times that one. One, two, three. If my Y movement is up one, I'm gonna go one, two, three. If my Y movement is up four, I'm gonna go four, eight, 12. But I'm gonna triple whatever that is. I call that the cheap trick. Name that for the 70s rock band. Do you remember the cheap trick? The cheat trick just says, treat your A, take your A and put A over one, and treat it like slope, but only once. Okay, so if my A is three, from here I'm gonna go rise three, run one. And because it's an axis of symmetry there, I can run one the other way. And that gives me two quick points. Why do I only do it once? What happened if I kept doing three over one? Then I get an absolute value graph, right? I get lines, and that's not a problem. So it's, a, it's not a good trick, it's a cheap. Why did I write treat? <laughs> trick. It's a, oh, yeah. Trick and cheap together. Anyway, whatever. So it's a cheap trick, but it is a way to kind of quickly graph two points. And most of the time when you have an A value, you've already stretched it so much, it's hard to get that second one in anyway. I mean, think about it, I'm gonna have to go over up 12. A lot of times that won't even fit on the graph. 
So that will give you three points, and with three points, you can probably sketch a pretty decent, a pretty decent parabola. How would you know how to get the straight line? The what? Like the, the if you have those, then what about the multiple ones? I know you said Again, like if I know that my basic parabola, remember I had you memorize on a basic parabola, y equals x squared. It was the origin, and then one one, two four. Because the thing about it, you plug a one in, you go up one, you plug a two in, you go up four. So if in my head I know I'm gonna go up over two, up four, if there's a three, I'm gonna go over two, up four times three, which would be 12. And again, you can always plot points, but I'm usually just looking for a quick sketch of these. Does that make sense? Okay, now, that's what I do when the number is bigger, like three or four or something like that. What if it's a 12 or an eight? Think about this. If my value here, if this was my parabola, I'll make it negative this time. And I go, all right, my vertex is at negative two, one. Negative two, one. This time my parabola, my A value is negative, but it still leads with Y, so it's going down. Does it make much sense to try the cheap trick? And remember, the cheap trick does not say up uh, 1 12th is the slope. It says put A over 1. So the cheap trick literally tells you to rise a negative 12 and then go over 1. Well, those points are so close together, yeah, it's going to be wide, but it really doesn't give you a great idea about the width. This is where I come in with the lattice rectum. Okay, now do you remember what the lattice rectum is? What does lattice mean in Latin? For those of you that take Latin, which seems like the entire school. Lattice means width. Nobody takes, who takes Latin in here? You all don't know lattice? Y'all haven't learned lattice? Lattice, latus. No, you don't I took it in ninth grade, I remember that. Lattice means width, okay? And rectum actually has a referral to opening. Oh, well. Probably figured that out. Yikes. But the width, what it's saying is the width of the opening at the focus. So if I have a parabola, there's a focus somewhere. There's a focus that I'll talk about in a second, and it's saying it's the width at the focus. So if I can figure out where the focus is, then I can just mark that width. Well, here's how easy this is. Whatever that number is, right there, your A value, if you flip it, that's your lattice rectum. So your lattice rectum right here, actually I don't, it doesn't really, it just says one over A, and then make it positive because it's a length. So if my A is 1 12, one over A means flip the A, my lattice rectum is 12. Are you all with me on that? And if the lattice rectum is 12, here's where this comes in, and you might wanna write this down. The lattice rectum is four times the C value. Now you can see that right here, the length of the lattice rectum is four times the C. Well, if my lattice rectum is flip the A, which is 12, and 12 is 4C, then what does your C end up being? Three. And this is where you might want to write this. Oh no, it's right here. Distance from the vertex to the focus. So once I find my C value, I can just, well, if the parabola is going down, I can just go down one, two, three, that's from the vertex to the focus, and then mark the length of my lattice rectum. So right here, I have the vertex. I'm gonna go down one, two, three, mark my focus, and then my lattice rectum's 12, so I'm gonna go to the right, one, two, three, four, five, six, and to the left, one, two, three, four, five, six, and that gives me three points, and three points is gonna be good enough for me to sketch this parabola. So I use the cheap trick to find a couple points for A values when they're like one or bigger. And when they're tiny fractions, I use the, the, uh, the lattice rectum to find it. Y'all seeing that? And this kind of walks you through the process that I just did um, for this particular problem. If you haven't been writing anything down, which is always a questionable plan. But right here, so on this particular example, that I'm giving right here, I got down to here, and if I'm graphing this, I'm like, all right, vertex is negative four, three. All right, my A value is an eight, so all I gotta do to find the lattice rectum is flip it, and that's eight. 
And then my C value, all I, since the C value, sorry, this is the way I did it. Since I said the lattice rectum equals 4C, and the lattice rectum is 8, all I have to do to find C is, is that. I'm using C equals a fourth of the lattice rectum, but that's kind of the same thing, right? The lattice rectum is 4C, then C is a fourth of the lattice rectum. And then once I get that 2, once I know that, all I have to do is take my vertex, which is right here, right? Negative 4, 3. This graph had a positive A value, and Y came first. So I'm going to go up 2 to mark my focus. And then my width of my opening was 8. So I went over 4, over 4, and that gave me the three points that I need. Go with me. Are we good? Okay, other things you might want to know. What the heck is this directrix thing? Okay, now the directrix is also going to be, instead of C up to find the focus, it's C down. So if you move up two places to find that point, you're going to move down two places to find that line. And if you want to know really what in the world a directrix is doing, you do not need a directrix to graph your, vert uh, your parabola at all. But the definition of a parabola is all the points that are the same distance from a focus and a line. So if you really think about it, pretend there's nothing on the page here, and I just said, hey, there's this line right here, and there's this point. Mark all the points that are the same distance from here as they are from here. Well, you'd start eyeballing it, and you'd go, well, this one in the middle is, and then maybe if I go over one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, yep, those two distances are the same. Those two distances are the same. There's also a bunch in here, like that distance is the same as that distance. That distance is the same as that. That distance is the same as that. And all of these points meet that condition. But you don't really need the directrix to be able to do that. For you to be able to do it, right? Because we graph it in a better way than just guessing and checking or doing some ancient proof. Right? All right. Okay, um, completing the square is a little trickier. When you see one of these, how can you just eyeball it right now and tell whether it's a parabola circle? What's the easiest way to tell right there? There's only one squared term. So if you only see one squared term, where do you want that squared term to end up being? On the right. Now you'll see I am going against what I just said. I actually changed this in my other class. I must have forgotten to change it here. I usually, right off the bat, move the squared stuff over to the right. Here, I just left it there and moved the other stuff over, and then right here, I just switched places. Does that make sense? So you can, I normally, when I make my keys now, when I make them out, I just move my squared stuff over, and I don't care that it becomes negative, because I'm gonna probably end up factoring out that A value anyway. But my process here was, separate the non-squared stuff from the squared stuff, factor out a two, and if you're wondering why I didn't divide it out like I did with the circle, well, if I divide it out, which is okay, I'm losing part of my A value, what could end up being my A value. And I want that A value out front. I didn't want it out front on a circle, but I do on a parabola. So if you know that, I just go, oh, well, I'm just gonna factor it out. It's just the same as dividing, except I don't have to mess with this side and then I complete the square with that inside part. But what do you have to be careful about? When I take half of eight, I get four, I square it, I get 16, but I don't add 16, why? To the other side, why? Because it's really two times 16, right? And then once I get to here, I'm home free, I switch places, but why can't I stop here? If I want all of these things to mean something, why can't I stop there? Because there's a 16 in front of that Y, and that's not good form. Like, it, it, if it's not in the right form, then, like Anderson will tell you, you can't tell what the vertex is, you can't tell what the A is, you can't tell any of that stuff, can you? No. No way. Right. Even if you're deep, deep in thought. So, right here, how would I fix, uh, finish that or fix that if there's a 16 sitting out there? Factor it out, and then do what? Well, you don't have to factor it out, but... Divide it out. So what I did is I just said, well, to get it out, I'm just going to multiply through by 1 16. Now, you can divide by 16. That's totally fine. If I divide by 16, I get y 
minus three, and then when you divide that by 16, you get two over 16, which is an eight. But if you do one sixteenth, it kind of reminds you that, oh yeah, I'm just really multiplying by that lead term. But you decide how you want to do that. All right? Is that, does that y have to be positive as well? Yeah, the y has to be positive, and that's if it's y and x squared. If it's x, the x has to be positive. There has to be a one there when all said and done. Or it's just not in the right form. Like if, if this still had a negative here, if it did, then you'd look at this and go, oh, positive A value must be going up. You'd also look at this and go, oh, my vertex is at negative four, three, right? But if I multiply through by a negative, now I'm like, oh, actually my vertex is negative four, negative three, and the parabola's going down. So make sure it's in the right form or all of these rules don't mean anything to you, okay? So how do I find the lattice rectum? So flip the A. How do you find the C value? So take one fourth of the lattice rectum. What's the C value do for me? So it's the distance from the, from the vertex to the focus, but also to the directrix. And the directrix is a line, so don't write a point there. And the, vertex, the focus is a point, so don't write a line there. And are there degenerate parabolas? Actually, yes. Will you ever see one? No. You know why? Here's a degenerate uh, parabola. Whoa. But who's going to say, oh, degenerate parabola? You sneaky, Mr. Hurry. I mean, it's a line. If you think about back to this shape, remember we said a parabola is when you slice it parallel to the edge? But for me to slice it parallel to the edge and go through that tip, I would just have to skim the edge right there. And if I skim the edge, I just get a line. Well, so you will never, you will never see or have to worry about looking up here and going, wait, I wonder if this ends up being degenerate. It won't be. It can't be. The only way to get degenerate is for that x squared term to go away. And for the only way to get the x squared term to go away is for what? What would that have to be? A zero, and if there was a zero there, guess what? It wouldn't be there. And you would just look at it and see some line. Are y'all seeing that? So you don't have to worry about parabolas being sneaky and not existing or being degenerate. You won't have to worry about it. So far so good? Okay, I'm gonna start edging into, I, for your homework tonight, what I would do is get on those worksheets and see if you can answer all the questions about lines, parabolas, that kind of stuff, and then maybe start edging into ellipses. I'm going to start with ellipses until the bell goes, and then we'll finish up this conversation and then just really try to get a ton of practice in. All right? But I would not just, you don't have to turn anything in tomorrow. You don't have to turn anything in tomorrow, but I would not be just taking the night off because we don't know all that stuff yet. Try to knock out what you do know. All right? I'll tell you what, let me just do this. What if I gave you this? Uh, X plus one equals negative 1 20th y plus 3 squared. Who can tell me what the lattice rectum is here? 20. Not negative 20, but 20 because it's a length, right? Who can tell me what the c value is? It's a fourth of that, so 5. Who can tell me what the vertex is? Negative 1, negative 3. Who can tell me what direction this is going or which way it's opening? Left. left, because X is first, which means right or left. Negative A value means it's opening to the left. So if you had to graph this, you should go negative one, negative three. You'd be down there. You'd have, what would you do to get to the focus? Where would the focus be if this thing is opening left? It would be left, right? Remember we talked about focus? How do you focus with your eyes, right? And you walk around with your eyes. Most people don't walk around like this, right? Your eyes lead the, lead the way. So if I wanna know where my graph, where my focus is, it's the direction the graph is opening, right? Because the focus kinda <clears throat> leads the way. So if I'm heading this way, my focus is in here, and my directrix would be on the back end, okay? So how do I get to the focus again? I would move 
five this way, wouldn't I? So I would go over one, two, three, four, five. Now, what is that point? And you know a good way to do that is if I know I'm going left from the vertex, just subtract five from the x coordinate. Negative six, negative three. You don't even have to visualize this graph. Does that make sense? If I'm heading left, if I'm heading down, I would subtract five from the y coordinate and end up with a negative eight. Now, how do I find the directrix? Instead of subtracting five from the x, going this way, I'm going to add five, but when I add five, what do I get? I get four, but remember, it's not a point, so don't write four negative three, write, what did you just change? Which value? You changed the x, didn't you, when you add five to it? So just say x equals four. That's the line going through x at four. If you change the y value, say y equals. And y'all remember the really trick way? I don't even think I mentioned it. You might want to put it in there. But do you remember how to find the axis of symmetry? The axis of symmetry always ends up being whatever that is set equal to zero. A little trick. So if you set that equal to zero, y equals negative three, but you can see that, right? Y equals negative three is the line that's going to split this. So now that I have my directrix, my focus, my vertex in there, how would you sketch this graph? What do we do? Go up to the focus and go up down. From the focus, right? The lattice rectum is the width of the opening through the focus. The lattice rectum was 20, so I'm going to go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 there. I'm going to go down 10, and I'm going to sketch as good a parabola as I can do from there. You with me? Again, lots of things you can practice tonight. Um, and then hopefully by the end of tomorrow, we'll have most of this down. And again, if you're like, oh my gosh, there's a lot in my brain right now. Honestly, circles and, uh, hyper uh, circles and parabolas probably have the least amount of information. I mean, when you get to ellipses, there's a lot going on in there. Okay? There's a couple new things we'll talk about, but a lot going on. Hyperbolas, a lot going on. Maybe not quite well, a lot going on. Okay, now the upside is, Ellipses and hyperbolas have a lot of commonalities. And even their differences have some things in common. So even though they look a lot different from each other, there's a lot of things that we can learn from them and, um, and relate with them. All right, I tell you what, I'm just gonna call it a day. So that's circles and parabolas. Please, for your sake, get through all of that stuff on those first two reviews, and then we'll jump into this stuff tomorrow. And, and we gotta be ready to test next Thursday. All right, I want to give you at least two days of review in here. All right? All right.